So when looking at evolution, the three major requirements is that that population has to have variation, that variation has to be inherited, and there has to be a mechanism that changes that in that variation. Now we've already talked about some of those mechanisms of change, such as gene flow, genetic drift, as well as non-random mating. And this video is going to look at different types of selection, so specifically artificial, sexual, and natural selection. So let's start with artificial selection. The other term, maybe the more one used in everyday language, is also called selective breeding, and the concept of it is the same. Humans, and I very specifically have humans here, so it's not organisms, humans are going to influence the individuals who reproduce. This can be plants, this can be animals, fungi, bacteria, etc. And because humans are choosing who's reproducing, in essence, we're choosing which traits exist and which traits are passing on to the next generation. So it's not a question of, oh, well, that organism survived, or that one got more food, or that one was more attractive. It's humans facilitated the breeding of that organism. So two examples, uh, the first one we'll talk about is dogs and wolves. This is the classic artificial selection uh, example. Dogs as we know it today are not wild animals. We did not have Dalmatians running in our forests, uh, but instead we had wolves. Within the wolf population, there was variance in coat color, coat length, temperament. And after many, many generations of humans kind of influencing which ones we're reproducing, uh, you have the various breeds that we have today. Now, despite this being maybe one of the most famous or more, most well-talked about examples, I have a better example, or maybe even a more common example, is our food, the crops that we eat. So here's a picture of corn. This is one of many, many different crops that we consume. And on the left part of this picture is what wild corn looks like. This is how it grows in the wild. Now humans, when we started our kind of agricultural revolution and uh, began farming, we took these different foods that we found in the wild, that we got some sort of nutrition from, and we started selectively breeding them. And essentially what we did is the corn that had slightly more kernels, we would breed with other corn that had slightly more kernels. And then you have some of these intermediates where it's like, okay, we're getting more kernels, they're larger kernels. That's what we as humans, when we eat, that's what we, we want. And so what we would do is in the ones that had slightly larger kernels, we bred with others with slightly more kernels until we get even more kernels, so on and so forth, until you get the corn that you shop for today in the grocery store. Pretty much every single food that you purchase in the produce section at a grocery store is the result of artificial selection. Very, very, very few of those exist like that naturally in the wild. Now, it's all genes that exist in corn, it's just that we have been choosing, generation after generation, the corn, the broccoli, the tomatoes, that have those traits that we desire for consumption. So that's artificial selection, humans choosing essentially those traits by choosing the organisms that reproduce. Another type of selective force is sexual selection. And sexual, sexual selection um, has to occur in organisms that sexually reproduce. So there is a male and a female, and there is some sort of mate choice. So in most animals, not all of them, but in most animals, it is a female choosing between multiple males. There are examples where it's one male and it's choosing between females, but more often than not, way more often than not, it's the female mate choice. Now, when I say it's them choosing, so it's not because one organism got more food, it's not because one uh, escaped predation, it's literally because there is some sort of characteristic that the male or the female possesses that makes it more attractive to the opposite sex. So the example I have here, Oh, we're looking at peacocks, that's the name um, of the males, that's what you see on the bottom, and this brown kind of drabbier one is the female, this is the peahen. 
And so what the peahen gets to do, the reason she's so drab and is brown and really not that colorful is that the males are the ones fighting. The males are the ones who want to get with her. So the males need to be large and showy and colorful and have large uh, tail feathers and the prettier they are, and we'll talk more about that specifically in a second, the prettier they are, the more likely that the female will choose the male. And if the female chooses the male, the male reproduces and will pass on that trait of being showier to the next generation. Again, this can happen in the inverse as well. It can be males choosing females. Now there's actually a study, just to tell you a little bit more about this peacock example, is a study actually tried to quantify showiness. Like what exactly was being chosen for by the female? And the study found a correlation between females choosing males that had more circles on their tail feathers. So if you look here, there's like these little, it's a pattern, I'm just gonna call it a circle for short. And it found that females more often than not were choosing the males that had the most circles. Now, is the female saying like, huh, one, two, three, four, five. No, she's not actually counting the number of circles, but there's something just innate where she's like, that is more attractive. That's, that's the one I am choosing. And it just so happens that attractiveness is just number of circles. If you're kind of like, I don't quite get it. A common study in humans is actually very similar where uh, some studies have shown that humans prefer more symmetrical faces. So we're not looking like, oh, let me put a line of symmetry here. Like, is it about even? You and I, we're not looking at someone and actively evaluating how symmetrical their face is. It's just something that our brain is processing for us. And there's some sort of evolutionary reason why we prefer, or at least find more attractive, faces that are symmetrical. Well, with peacocks, it's similar. Even though, no, they're not actively counting the number of circles, there's something wired in their brain that is equating uh, more circles as more fertile or more successful, that I'm gonna have more offspring or more successful offspring if I stick with males that are showier, aka have more circles. Now, mate choice, is not necessarily always on physical behaviors. It can also be thinking about birds. It can be bird songs. So a lot of songbirds are using their songs to attract mates. It can also be on dances. And that's really all I'm gonna say there. So there's gonna be a YouTube video that pops up soon. So what I want you to do is pause this video, click on the link that's popping up above me, and take a look at some of the other breeding behaviors, in this case, birds have, where sexual selection is being acted on. So again, pause here, click the link above me, and then come back here. So in this class, we're gonna watch a lot of videos, and honestly, that's probably one of my favorites, uh, because how many times do you see a moonwalking bird? Again, similar thing, the better you can moonwalk, the better you can sing, the better you can do whatever, you are gonna have a mate choice. The female is choosing you because of this characteristic related to reproduction. The last type of selection, and again, this is a mechanism of change, how do we change genetic variants in our populations is natural selection. And honestly, this is the one that we're gonna focus on the most in this class, uh, mainly because it's very, like it's easy to find so many examples of it in nature. So this is what we're gonna focus on the most, uh, not just now, but also just in the future. We can use natural selection to explain, to explain a lot. So individuals have adaptations. And what I mean by an adaptation, it's, it's a characteristic, it can be a physical, it could be a molecular characteristic that makes that organism more successful in their environment. I'm not saying more successful compared to other males or other females. So sexual selection would be more successful in, in that mate choice. But with natural selection, we're saying more successful in your environment, meaning you're able to get more food, you're able to survive a harsh winter, you're able to escape predation, you're able to survive more. And because of that, 
that means if you can survive longer, if you can live longer, you're going to reproduce more and you're going to pass on those traits you have to the next generation. You may have heard the term survival of the fittest, and I do want to pause here. I bolded fittest on purpose. Fittest does not mean strongest. Fittest does not mean fastest. Fittest is a, let me go ahead and um, write this for you. Fittest, fittest is a conjugation of fitness. So it, you could also say survival of the individuals with the most fitness. Fitness, although you and I kind of use it as like, oh yes, like I'm in a PE class. Ecologically, what fitness means is your ability to reproduce. So if you have the survival of the fit, fittest, what you're saying is you have the survival of those that can reproduce the most. Now, the reason they reproduce more is because they got more food, because they survived longer, because they found shelter, because they could find a mate, etc. If you can't find food, you're going to die and either you don't reproduce or barely reproduce. If you uh, aren't fast and predators catch you, you're going to die and not reproduce. If you can't find adequate shelter, then maybe you reproduce, but a lot of your offspring don't survive. So natural selection is really about survival of the organisms that can reproduce the most. So we'll talk about some examples of adaptations. So here we have a snowshoe hare. This is found in Arctic areas. They have white fur. If there is variation in the fur color of our hairs, so those that are a little bit browner likely get predated upon more. They don't blend in as much. So the fittest in this case are just the ones that have whiter fur. They blend in more, meaning they don't get predated upon as much. Another example, thinking about cacti, there's lots of different cacti, and the spines that they have. The spines that they have are a great predator deterrent. This is important because they are holding on to water, uh, which is another adaptation for surviving in the desert. And to protect that water, they have this defense system. Cacti that have smaller spines or maybe a mutation where, where they're non-existent aren't going to survive as long and likely aren't going to reproduce or reproduce nearly as much as those that are more heavily fortified. And then it's also not just physical characteristics. It can also be things happening at the molecular level. Or this picture is just showing you a behavior. So humans and shivering. Well, the reason we shiver is because it uh, essentially spazzes our muscles, which is going to generate energy, which generates heat, helping us to stay warm. If you don't shiver as much, or maybe you don't shiver at all, at all, if you're out in the environment, you are likely more likely to die of hypothermia than someone who is shivering. So these are all examples of adaptations and how they're helping that organism to survive in their environment. If you lack those adaptations or if you have a weaker form of that adaptation, you likely won't survive as long, you likely won't reproduce as much, which means you're not going to be passing on those traits to the next generation. Something uh, I don't even know if related, sure, yeah, related or a consequence of natural selection is this idea of convergent evolution. Now think of the word converge. Converge, I think of something that's far apart and it comes together. It converges together. And convergent evolution is, is not really evolution at all. We use the term evolution, but it's really not quite right. So convergent evolution is this idea that organisms organisms living in the same environment are subjected to the same selective pressures. So for example, organisms that live in the ocean, right? The, the ocean is the same color for all these organisms. The ocean is water. And so traveling through that water, there is better and worse ways to travel through water, right? If you're more hydrodynamic versus like you are a cube traveling through water, like one is definitely better than the other. And so what happens with natural selection is that very, very different organisms, in this picture I've got a mammal, a fish, a reptile, a bird, very different organisms. Looking at them, they have a lot of similarities. They have these nice streamlined bodies. They all have flippers. They're all like a, a bluish, grayish, blackish color. 
And it's not because these guys have a common ancestor. It's not because, you know, sharks and penguins are related and so of course they look similar. No, these are very different organisms. The reason they look similar is because of natural selection. It's because they all live in the same habitat and natural selection kept favoring similar traits. Yes, the reason they're all this gray bluish color is because that blends in with water. All right, we don't see tons of bright orange or, or uh, deep purple because that's not the color of water. We don't see more blocky shaped and more, um, I don't know, weird shapes because that doesn't move as quickly through water. So the idea of convergent evolution is just organisms look similar only because they're in similar environments, not necessarily because, oh, they're all related to one another. That's why they look like each other. Now, there is a name for these similar structures and similar adaptations we see, and it's called analogous structures. So for example, the, the flippers of a penguin and the fins of a dolphin would be considered analogous. It's a structure that has the same function Right? In this case, the function is swimming through water, but the form, so the underlying skeletal structures, the where these are derived from are very, very different uh, from one another. We're going to talk about something else later on in this unit. Uh, so just keep in the definition in mind of they have a similar function, in this case, swimming in water, but a different form. The, the way that flipper is... Uh, arranged in their body is different because birds and mammals are very distantly related. Just to give you one more example of another analogous structure is looking at the wings uh, between birds, bats, pterosaurs, Japanese flying squirrel. You could even add insects uh, to this as well. So butterflies, dragonflies, etc. Where, hey, they all fly. They all have wings but the structures of which are very, very different. They're all similar because they all uh, have this adaptation to survive um, in these kind of environments, but it's not because, oh, birds and insects are closely related. They both have wings and they both um, stem from a common ancestor with wings. No, they independently evolved wings, but the reason they did is they must have lived in similar conditions and similar habitats that favored the evolution of wings. And so that is pretty much where I'm going to leave you guys. So again, we were exploring how genetic variants can change in our populations, essentially based on selective pressures, whether it's humans, whether it's the... Um, whether it's related to sexual reproduction, so males choosing females or females choosing males, or just the environment, predation, availability of food, ability to survive impacts which genes pass on to the next generation.